Hello, my little nightmares. Welcome to chapter two of the Alpha Syndicate series, where we tag along with an elite team hunting the paranormal. For those of you who missed their first mission, I've linked it below. And for those already caught up, let's jump right in. Five. Trevor's voice crackled in the headset as I pressed my body against the wall. I looked over to Paige, watching as she quickly put a small brick of C4 over the door frame. Her eyes met mine as she gave me a nod. I returned it and checked my rifle, making sure the suppressor was tight. Four. The glint of Eric's scope reflected off the moonlight in the distance. He was about a hundred yards away, sights trained on the door. The rose bush that he was sitting in swayed gently in the summer breeze. Looking around, this place really did have its own type of beauty. The garden was dotted with different kinds of flowers. Roses, tulips, and orchids flooded the landscape in a sea of colors. It felt like I had been dropped into a Van Gogh painting. Three. I checked my face mask, making sure it was secured over my mouth and nose. I could feel the rubber digging into my cheeks, breathing in the filtered air, hot and stale. Briefing indicated potential airborne agents that would cause change, metamorphosis, Trevor called it, a forced evolution and an unwanted one. Two. I felt Wade's tap on my shoulder, signaling me. My hand shot to my hip, grabbing a flat black square. I stuck it to the door frame and jammed my finger on the center. Instantly, five red dots popped up on the square, moving erratically, almost jerking, moving smoothly only for a second or two, then stopping and jumping forward. I turned and held up five fingers to Wade, who nodded and slammed the bolt home on his machine gun. One. I took a breath to settle my heart rate, feeling the ridges of the rifle's grip. It was calming. Like as long as I held on, nothing could ever hurt me. Paige's detonator, being primed, snapped me from my self-reflection as quickly as it came. One more breath, one more second of safety. Send it. The calm was gone. The storm was here. The shit had hit the fan and there was no turning back. The charge shattered the door to splinters. I raised my rifle, turned in, and went to work. There was no time to think. Instinct fueled me as I pushed inside, my eyes locking onto the target in front of me. The blast must have knocked them to the ground, seeing as they were still struggling to get to their feet. Grabbing at a table to level themselves, I put two shots in the thing and swung left. On your six, Rook. I felt Paige glide behind me as she put two into another one on the right-hand side of the table. It was hard to focus. Trevor had cut the power so while I knew we were in the kitchen, I could hardly see anything. I moved slowly around the table, listening for footsteps, watching the shadows for anything out of place. Something gave out a gurgled cry and lunged at me from the left side and I jumped backward. I had made it just in time as a large cleaver wedged itself into the hardwood. The creature chattered to itself while trying desperately to pull the knife out, making strange scritches and groans. Sounded like a lab rat that knew his time was up. The thing made it real easy for me to sight in as I turned its brain into mist spraying the back wall with what was left of whatever it was. A few more shots let off before I heard. Clear. A neon green light took over the room as Paige cracked a glow stick and dropped it onto the table. Now that I was actually able to see, I could tell how nice the kitchen was. A long industrial-sized shell of a room wrapped around me. Pans hung from the ceiling, dropping down and swaying a bit before giving a soft little chime. The table itself must have been used to carve meat. It was stained all over with blood, the once yellowed wood taking on a soft orange hue with bones littering the tabletop. I bent down to pick one up and examine it. It was thin and long, possibly a rib bone. It had been stripped whole and bleached a bright white. What stood out to me most, though, was the number of bite marks covering it. I looked down and examined the rest. They were all the same, stripped and bleached, yes, but not on. It came to me that these bones started to get bigger. Different bones, different parts from the corpse. These bones looked familiar. They couldn't have been from an animal. Think I found Delta's guy, I said after dropping the bone back into the heap. You're sure? Paige answered back after kicking a body away from the table. Come see for yourself. There was a deep purple covering where the whites were supposed to be, and cat-like cuts for the irises. I let it go with a wet smack onto the blood-covered tile. Whoever these creatures were before the change, they made a damn good job to be as far from human as possible. 
Paige's voice broke me from my thoughts. Whiskey two to whiskey one, how copy? Copy, whiskey two. Trevor's voice came back. What do you got? We found Delta three. What's left of her anyway? Primary objective reached, requesting extraction. Before Trevor could respond, an angry, oily voice, heavy in a New Jersey accent, came over the line. Negative, whiskey two. Stand by. The line went dead as Paige let out a frustrated groan. Damn it, Shay. Shay was the leader of Delta Team, one of the Syndicate's 26 squads that operated around the world. He prided himself on pulling the most dangerous and lucrative jobs. That clout, however, came with him running his team ragged. Job after job, often operating for more than a month at a time. No wonder his girl got mad. Whiskey two, be advised. Trevor came back online again. Operational parameters have changed. Changed to what, Trevor? Paige responded with just a hint of frustration. This is no longer a snatch and grab. Rendezvous with Delta at the entrance and initiate extermination protocols. I could feel Paige's frustration grow, but she just nodded and responded. Understood. Whiskey two out. The line went dead as she reloaded and walked towards the door leading deeper inside. Come on, Rook. Her voice was laced with equal parts venom and determination. I told you back in that conference room we'd be cleaning up this wanker's mess. The conference room had been packed when we walked in. At least ten people inside, huddled together in tiny groups on opposite sides of the room. Each one strapped down with various weapons and decked out in the latest gear the Syndicate could afford. Do we normally pull joint ops with other teams? I asked as I took a seat and reached for a manila folder marked Operation Gardener in big red letters. Not a common thing, but not unheard of either. Trevor said, scanning the room. Happened a lot more back in the good old days, back when the Syndicate just started out. We didn't have the training and vetting we do now. Half the time, it seemed like they just found the biggest dude in the bar and put a gun in his hand. I tried to keep my head down a bit and act like that's not exactly how they got me. If it ain't broke, then don't fix it, I guess. Looks like we got Romeo and Delta along for the ride, he continued before walking up to a woman on the right of us. She was tall, with jet black hair that was half shaved, leaving the other side to fall over the left of her face. The MP5 she wielded was strapped to her waist while she thumbed through another op folder. She stopped when Trevor approached and gave a smile. Hey Kate, how you been? My, my, my. If it isn't Trevor Whitlock, been a while. Her voice was soft and seductive, like she breathed it into Trevor's ear and said it out loud. Last I heard, you had some trouble on the Nile. Never trouble, just a minor, he scratched the scruff of his short graying beard as he thought, inconvenience. That's not what I heard, she said in a sing-song voice as she stood upright. She was easily half a foot taller than he was. At least, that's not what management says. Management says a lot of things. That they do. When I got word Romeo was taking over your contracts for the time being, I feared the worst. She stepped a bit closer to Trevor. Whatever tension was currently happening, it didn't seem to phase him. Look, if we need to leave, just say it. Eric piped up, resulting in a hand planting itself firmly into the back of his head, courtesy of Paige. Don't get used to it, Trevor responded after a moment. Kona's duty just gave me a chance to get the kid trained up. We'll be back in the field in no time. This caused her attention to turn towards me. She began making her way over and put her hand out to shake mine. Kate Watanabe she said with a smile that was trying way too hard to be friendly. Marcus Kent, I said as I took her hand and shook it. She seemed odd. Doll-like would be the best way to describe it. Like she wanted you to notice her, to like her. She let go of my hand and turned back to Trevor, completely ignoring the others. Good seeing you, Trevor. Stay out of trouble now, okay? She said with a wink as she joined the rest of her team. Man, I hate her. I heard Paige let out as soon as Kate was out of earshot. You just hate her because she's into Trevor, Eric said teasingly. Ain't that right, Wade? Look, man, Wade said, dropping into his chair with a mighty thud. There's only a few things I'm scared of. Paige is one of those things. You're on your own. We all let out a laugh as Trevor walked back, leaning in so only we could hear. Do you think for just once you can act like professionals? Did you even consider why they pulled two teams off active duty and brought us up? The table grew silent as we all looked down or away, anything to not meet his gaze. He waited a moment before exhaling and sitting next to me. 
Grab a folder and pay attention. Here they come. Susan Bell, the short, stubby woman who acts as the main presenter in briefings, walked down the aisle towards the projector. By her side, however, walked a large, barrel-chested gorilla of a man wearing a muscle tank and cargo pants. His skin was tanned, well, from what I could see, as most of it was covered in arm hair. His face didn't leave anything bare either. A gruff beard ran from neck to lip, then up to an unkempt goatee. The mutton chops on the side of his head covered his jaw as they reached out to touch his chin. A long, jagged scar across his eye completed his wild man look. He approached the podium as Susan dimmed the lights and turned on the projector. Whatever conversations that were still being had immediately went silent as he placed a massive shotgun on the table next to him. Evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Shayla Grand, leader of Delta and operation overseer for this mission. We stayed silent as the projector flipped through to an image of a Latin man. He was smiling with his hair slicked back wearing a tuxedo. It was a pretty old picture judging from the graininess, maybe taken back in the 90s. Meet Raul Delgado, Bolivia's hotshot botany genius, way back when. This is the last known picture of Raul before his trek into the Amazon basin. He was in search of finding plants that could be used to counteract something known as Stoneman syndrome, a disease that causes the body to overproduce calcium deposits and make bone grow on the outside of the body. This, he said as the slide change, is when he returned. On the screen was a black and white photo of something. It was humanoid for sure, but it was also pure white, latticed with shards of bone crossing and weaving the whole body where his head of slick black hair once was, now rested a cocoon of bone. It twisted and circled around his face till it ended in a small black hole in the center. It was walking towards the camera, arms outstretched as if it was ready to be carried off by angels. In one hand, he held a small, leather-bound book. In the other, he was clutching a flower. Its bright white seemed to draw a blind spot in the photo, like every other color that was present when the picture was taken was drawn into it. Each petal was marked with a single dot, and the stem itself was as long as the thing that was holding it. He was gone two years. In that time, he not only contracted the disease, it had mutated. The man could walk, talk, and have full cognitive function. He would later go on to publish a manifesto. The slide changed to the same picture as before, yet zoomed in to focus on the book. In it, he describes his journey in the jungle, how he became separated from his party, got lost, and floated for days down the river. Supposedly, he washed ashore on a long-forgotten Incan city. It was there he found the, quote, La Orquidea de Dios, or Orchid of God. The next slide showed a close-up of the flower. Even now, it was hard to get a good look at it. The photo seemed to burn out the closer it got to the petals. It was unsettling since the rest of the picture was normal. Yet, when it came to the orchid, it was warped, like it didn't want to be seen. He goes on and on, discussing how this orchid saved his life, how it allowed him to evolve, achieve a higher state of being. The manifesto was circulated through some fringe science communities online, gaining a bit of a cult following before Raoul fell completely off the radar. We believe it was to take that online following and turn it into something tangible and dangerous. The next slide showed pictures of at least 20 people, all of whom were on missing persons posters. In the past 10 years, more than 30 of the world's top biologists, botanists, and chemists have gone missing. Inside sources indicate that Mr. Delgado may be recruiting them for something called the cultivation. Local law enforcement has been trying for years to get a strike team in to search the place, but have been failing due to what they call unexplained electromagnetic phenomena. Seems that whatever is going on there blocks out all satellite signals, in an attempt to gather information for interested third parties, I have opted to send one of my own undercover to Mr. Delgado's mountainside estate for reconnaissance. This last slide stood out from all the others, not for its bleakness, but for its beauty. A mansion rested on top of a hill surrounded by a sea of flowers. Dozens of colors danced across the landscape. It went on forever, nearly enveloping the house as it crept up and over the driveway, surrounding and drowning the cars parked there. In the last few weeks, our contact has been relaying information while under the guise of a fan and follower of Delgado. She talked about how they began to import certain strains of flowers from all over the world. Additionally, 
they've begun research into air filtration systems, how they work, how to maintain them, etc. We had feared an attack was getting ready to take place until Ashley went dark. That's why you're all here. We're gonna raid that compound. A small murmur came from the tables surrounding us. People began spewing complaints left and right, mostly about what they were gonna be doing, who they were gonna be doing it with, and how much they were gonna get paid for it. Shay quickly had enough and slammed his fist onto the podium. Shut it, he bellowed as the murmuring died down. If you must know, the stipend is 100,000 per team, but I know you all have done a lot worse for a lot less, so I don't wanna hear shit about pay. We find Ashley, pull her out, cap a few people dumb enough to follow a nutcase with a green thumb and get the hell out. Am I clear? No one said anything as Shay scanned the room. Good. Romeo, you're on overwatch. There's a mountain range a half mile to the north of the compound. Whatever you say, I heard Kate's cool and calm voice ring out. Whiskey, you're the ground team with Delta. Breach through the kitchen here on the south side. Delta will breach in through the garage. We cover more ground. We find Ashley faster. Where's Whitlock? Trevor stood slowly with a groan and gave a stretch. Right here, brother. You're with me on the command line. Full control of the power grid and water supply. We'll have you linked in on a closed circuit comm channel to get us past the dead zone. Understood. Let's get it done. Try not to screw it up like you did Egypt. Shay said with a sly, shit-eating grin. I could feel the heat of anger begin building in Trevor. He took a second, but responded in the same tone. We won't let you down, man. You better not, now, Shay said while grabbing his shotgun and slinging it over his shoulders. You all have your orders. Move out. I followed Paige's lead as we tiptoed down the hall. We had to move slowly through the darkness, cracking open a chem light every few meters just to give off a smidge of glow. What was illuminated, however, put me into Delgado's shoes, into his path to madness. At first, everything seemed pretty normal. Multiple degrees on the wall, shitty modern art, dressers laden with books as thick as a dictionary, the works. As we kept going down, however, things began to evolve. It started subtly enough. A simple house plant rested on a stand. Even in the dim green glow, it looked beautiful. Deep purple leaves with a bright neon blue center. It was standing under a picture of Delgado and a woman. He was wearing a simple white suit that did well to give contrast to his dark skin. The woman was young with a bright, vibrant smile marked with a dimple on her right cheek and dark hair that came down to her waist. She wore a long white gown and several gaudy pieces of jewelry. In front of them both was a child, a boy wearing the same style suit as Raoul. Pretty much everything about him was the same. Same slick back hair, same skin tone. The only thing that stood out was the same dimple the woman had, reflected on him. I didn't know the Mark had a family. I said, looking behind me as I saw the big green light dangling off Wade's neck pause for a moment. A glance up the hall showed that Paige's light stopped as well. He doesn't. Paige's voice cracked back softly. We would have been briefed otherwise. Yeah, he does. I'm looking right at them. What are you talking about, man? Eric piped up. I heard the cracking of branches through the comms as he left his post to join us. I'm talking about the fact that Delgado has a wife and kid. Look! I turned and pushed the picture to Wade as he approached. He took and held it up close to his face, using the chem light to scan it. Slowly, his head came up, his eyes meeting mine as he tapped the earpiece and mined the number three. I switched over to channel three on the earpiece with a slightly indignant, What? There's no one here, man. But what do you mean there's no one there? I mean... He walked closer to me and showed me the picture again. My heart sank as I saw what he was talking about. There was no child. No woman smiling, happy and proud. There was no Raul Delgado. Just a picture of a flower. Its long stem reaching to the top of the frame, deep purple dots marking each white petal. What the hell? I muttered out. My hands shook softly as I studied the picture that was once a family portrait, only moments ago. Wait, man, I swear I know what I saw. I know. He replied with a slow nod. His voice, while deep, was trying its best to sound soothing, to calm me. We don't know the extent of this place. We don't know if these things can manipulate us by imagery or if it's strictly airborne. Until we do, keep these thoughts to yourself. Last thing we need is to be worried about one of our own. He was right. 
We were at that crossroads, where it was too late to turn back, yet too early for things to go wrong. All I could do was keep pushing forward. I put the frame back on the desk as a beeping noise came through the earpiece. We were being signaled. I flicked the comm channel as Paige's shrill chastising came through. Wait, Marcus, where the hell are you? Sorry, I said as I calmed the small flame of fear that burned in the back of my brain. Found something on one of these dressers. Wade came to see if he could figure out what it was. Give us a second, we're right behind you. No, Rook, you're not, she exclaimed as that flame ignited even brighter. I'm over by the entrance with Delta. How do you even get lost in a hallway? My eyes shot towards where I last saw her. There was nothing. No chem light, no cracked doorway to guide the way, only pitch blackness. I turned to Wade. His body was on edge as he scanned all around us. He looked over at me as I caught his eyes, apprehension causing them to appear twitchy and unfocused. I don't like this shit, man, he said as he fired up his mic. Eric, what's your 20? What are you talking about, man? I'm here with everyone. How the hell I got past your giant ass, I'm not sure of, but you told me to go ahead of you. No, Eric, I did not. He was shouting into the comm now, frantic to understand the position we were in. Just, uh, uh, Paige's voice came back, garbled over static. Paige, say again. I needed to hear them, to have that comfort and security that was so quickly jerked from underneath me. I was greeted with nothing but static. Paige, Paige. It was no use. She was already gone. My breath was ragged as Wade and I rushed down the hall. When Paige's and Eric's voice were reduced to static, we threw caution to the wind and took off. Whatever adrenaline that ran through us, however, was quickly extinguished when, after what must have been ten minutes of running, we had only seemed to make it about a hundred feet. The moonlight illuminating the doorway to the kitchen. What the hell? I heaved out, clutching my knees and gasping for whatever little sips of filtered air this mask would give me. It's hallucinogenic. Gotta be. Wade wasn't doing any better. He was upright, but only by leaning against the wall. He coughed loudly, clearing his throat, doing his best to hold down whatever he had in his stomach. After a moment or two, we both began to breathe properly and get our heads on right. Whatever this place is, wherever we are, we can't get there fast. I said as I pulled some more chem lights out of my pack and cracked one. We take it slow. Drop these every 100 paces. I could hear Wade grunt and exhale deeply as he nodded. Good idea. We need to see if we can get back into signal range, too. First things first. Lead the way. I got your six. We began making our way down the hall. For whatever reason, the house decided to give us passage as the light behind us started to dim. After a few minutes, we finally reached the end, coming up onto a single heavy oak door. Careful. Wade said just loud enough for the mic to pick up, almost at a whisper. I didn't answer audibly, just giving a single nod as I turned the handle, slowly. I inched the door open, pointing my muzzle inside, and began scanning the room. Without my needing to say so, I heard the crack of a chem light as Wade tossed it as far as he could. The light that came from where it landed showed high shelves, a large wooden desk, and books as far as the eye could see. We had found our way into the madman's study. We crept slowly inside. Everything on the walls hung still, caked in dust. This place looked like it hadn't been used in years. Don't believe it. Wade said as he kicked over some books stacked on the ground. What do you mean? I asked, looking back at him as I made my way over to the desk. All this shit. He waved his hands, gesturing to the room around us. I don't buy it for a second that any of this is real. Something here is screwing with the occipital and temporal lobes of the brain, simulating a psychotic break. We could be running around in a broom closet for all we know. Uh Uh-huh. I said as I began rifling through the drawers at the desk. There wasn't much inside save for a few empty binders and post-it notes. And what makes you an expert on human psychology? In this case, it's psychiatry. And the master's degree from Harvard does. He said matter-of-factly. I could almost see the smirk on his face as he no doubt could see the look of shock on mine. Dude. I said after taking a moment. Just how many jobs have you had? Enough to know what I'm talking about. He said, trying hard to stifle a laugh. Let's just say I've been around long enough to have diversified my portfolio. Sounds like it. So, how do we beat it? I cracked open a few more chem lights as I made my way to the far end of the room. 
Wade took a moment to think before sounding equal parts frustrated and defeated. In layman's terms, you don't. You can try to offset it, but to completely pull yourself out, you have to be pulled out by someone else. Of course we do. I thought. They could never make anything easy. Something changed as I took the steps into the inky darkness. Things weren't just dirty and unused. They were rotting. The shelves were cracked and chipped, covered in a mass of termites that feasted on the remains. The books went from old to archaic. I picked one up and thumbed through the pages. I couldn't even read it. The lettering faded into almost translucent paper. The spine was non-existent. This wasn't a library anymore, but a tomb. I had to fight the urge to empty my supply of light in this one room. I didn't want to be here. This wasn't supposed to go like this. Trapped here in this house of horrors, I clutched a light tight to my chest as I made my way onwards, toward the far wall. The shelves that lined my left and right were replaced by a large stone fireplace. You could have tossed a bear in there to roast with how wide it was. Off to the right-hand side stood another heavy black door, and above it, hooked onto the massive stone chimney, was another photo. This one was similar to the last. It was blown to massive proportions, like some kind of twisted family portrait. There was Raoul, standing there all dignified and still, well, human. It was hard to imagine that this face of scientific nobility would be morphed and twisted into the creature that we were now hunting. The kid looked largely the same as before. It was just, well, I couldn't put my finger on it, but he seemed terrified. Like his facial features and posture were the same, but he just, well, I could feel it. My eyes instinctively shot towards the woman. It was then that I knew what had changed. Her sweet, motherly smile was now gone. In its place sat two rows of thin, jagged teeth, curled into a joker-like grin. Her eyes cast down towards the boy, like she was sizing up her next meal. The once sleek, long hair was now matted in parts and wild in the rest, protruding in every direction, giving her the appearance of some sort of demented mad scientist. Wade came up from behind, startling me. For someone so big, he sure could be silent when he wanted to. What do you see? He said as his eyes scanned the picture, trying to discern what it was showing me. Well, I can tell you what it's not, I said, looking over to him. He responded with a single understanding nod. It felt comforting to know I wasn't going through this alone. Sure, Wade's brain wasn't being strapped down and forced to go through a Rorschach test every 20 minutes. But he was here. That's what mattered. So? I said after turning away from the portrait, facing him fully. Offsetting. How do we do it? Simple. He said, holding his gaze a bit longer on the picture before turning to me. Just think of something ridiculous. Something that can't be twisted and corrupted. All right. I said skeptically. Like what? He thought for a moment before letting out a small chuckle. <laughs> what? Well, what's an embarrassing story from your childhood? His question threw me for a loop. I nearly forgot that we were lost in a fun house stuffed with Heaven's Gate rejects. You're serious? I asked after a moment. As a heart attack. Um... I racked my brain, trying to think. Oh, I guess when I got caught wearing my sister's cheerleading outfit one time when I was six? There was silence for a moment. I saw Wade's laughter before I heard it, his body heaving back and forth. He let out a massive howl and clutched his stomach, laughing his ass off. Oh, man, I gotta hear the outcome of this. No, man, that wasn't the deal. What about you, huh? What stupid shit did little Wade get into? It took him a moment to stop laughing. Honestly, this conversation was making me feel a little bit better. It was easier to forget the last 30 minutes, even for a moment. Wade wiped his eyes as he looked at me. When I was little, I got attacked by a group of chickens. My grandpa had some that I would feed when I came to visit. I was about four, carrying a bucket one day when I tripped and got covered in feed. Little shits had a field day. It was my turn to laugh now. I clutched my stomach and howled, imagining the giant Wade being bested by some one-foot hens. I heard Wade's boots crunch on the floor as he put his hand on my shoulder. You laugh, but those things are ferocious. Feel better? I nodded and wiped my eyes. Yeah. I said, standing up and turning towards the door. Let's go put a bullet in this thing. 
He swept his hand towards the door as he positioned himself behind me. Lead the way, and remember, be aggressive. B-E aggressive. Oh, screw you. I said with a chuckle as I twisted the handle and threw the door open. The hallway we found ourselves in now was the complete opposite of the one before. Instead of the dark and dingy tunnel that we ran from, this place was a warm and cozy reprieve. Gone was the rotting hardwood. Instead, it was replaced by a rolling red carpet leading to a massive white door with six black dots painted in a circle around it. Candelabras dotted the many countertops and side tables in view, rendering our chem lights useless. Pictures covered the walls from top to bottom, all displaying the same unsettling image from the room before. Is it weird that this place is creepier than where we just came from? I said as I took a step inside. Maybe the house is settling for enticing over sheer terror. Wade whispered out as we made our way further in. Doubt it. I did my best to avoid looking at the pictures as I walked along. I didn't want to know what other shit this place was going to pull out of its bag of tricks. As I got about halfway, however, I couldn't stop myself. There was a glint at the corner of my eye, and I glanced over to take a look. I immediately wished I hadn't. The woman was leaning down to the boy now, her jaw unhinged to an enormous width as her teeth rested on either side of his head. His cheeks were swollen and red as a thin line of tears streaked down his face. I couldn't take it anymore. I was tired of being screwed with. I jammed my fist into the glass and ripped the photo from its frame, tearing it into pieces before dropping it to the floor. Easy, man. Don't let it get to you so bad. It's just... He trailed off as a noise started echoing in the room, like a fly right in your ear, an incessant buzzing. It was only when I looked down that I saw what it was. The torn shreds of the picture were moving, vibrating. I was about to bend down to inspect them when I heard the same sound coming from the frames on the desk and all of the pictures on the walls. Every single one was moving and shifting. It sounded like we were in an earthquake when suddenly they all stopped. Well, that was weird. Suddenly, all the glass shattered at once, covering us in a shower of clear, jagged grains. The pictures flew from their frames. They swirled around us before flying towards the white door. Please tell me I'm not the only one seeing this. I yelled out over the swelling cacophony of the paper smacking against the door, each photo overlaying the other, covering every free space it could. Trust me, you're not. Wade yelled. His eyes were wide and transfixed before him in terror. I turned back towards the door and saw why. My blood ran cold, the chill of recognition falling over me. The pictures were folding and twisting around each other at such speed that they began to make some semblance of a movie. The woman's face appeared as she was when I first saw her, smiling normal and meaningful, but that quickly began to change. Her eyes bulged as her smile widened to an inhuman size. Her teeth cracked on themselves, forming small, serrated daggers that began to hone in on the small boy. His tears were falling in motion now as he was powerless to move. She leaned down and opened her maw, a forked, snake-like tongue twisting and flicking against her now serpentine mouth. Her jaw extended wider, cracking the bones open as she settled it around his head and shoulders. My eyes met his, and for one brief moment he moved. His mouth silently mimed, Help me, as her jaw slammed shut. What the hell is this? I yelled as I clicked the safety off and raised it to the door. She released her jaws, letting the body fall flat and half-eaten, organs strewn on the flowing green grass. Time seemed to fast forward as she turned her attention to Raoul. Her body began to shift and twitch as bones dislocated and shattered. What was once a beautiful young woman turned into a long, flesh-colored serpent, wrapping herself around the man. He stood so still, like a statue, looking out at us as her jaw unhinged once again, and she latched onto his head. The snake began undulating and heaving as it worked its way down Raoul's body. He never moved, not even so much as a twitch. Before my eyes, the snake had reached his feet and lifted up, completely consuming him. I froze. I didn't know whether to pull the trigger and remove this from my sight, or turn and run. Its slitted eyes met mine as it heaved again, not a sick heave, but a heave of laughter. Its body shifted for the very last time, this time into the form of a human. It began growing long, bone-white appendages for its arms and legs. Its body wrapped itself in a carapace of lashing white exoskeleton. The final shift was completed by its head 
slowly bubbling like melted putty as it formed a cone around itself with one single black hole at the center. It stood there with its arms outstretched, its body bending backwards at an unnatural angle as it pushed its chest towards the sky. The pictures or camera or whatever the hell this was panned upward. It showed the sun beating down. So much was the intensity that I could nearly feel the heat. And then it was eclipsed. A vine, massive in size, passed in our view as we slowly panned back down. Before us sat a single being. It was covered in its bone white body. One hand outstretched and delicately, almost lovingly, wrapped around the bud of a flower. Its six white petals were each dotted with a single purple mark that seemed to suck in the light and color around it, clogging our vision. The orchid! I gasped out and started to turn to Wade. It's not the house doing this. It's not Raoul. It's that orchid! I stopped in my tracks. Wade's eyes were glossed over. His machine gun hung limply at his side as he smiled, tears streaming down his face. Do you see it? He asked, fighting back tears. Doesn't it look so beautiful? What? I slapped Wade across the face. Okay, no, not here. We're not doing this. Wake up, man. I snapped my fingers in his ears, shaking him. Nothing worked as he dropped to his knees, like he was kneeling to a higher power. All she wants is us to grow. He finally turned to me, smiling wide. To evolve. To become more than we are now. He clutched at me with his massive paws. We just need to let her in, Marcus. Wade! I slapped him again, this time harder. Snap out of it! It was like a toddler throwing a punch at Mike Tyson. Nothing seemed to work. Suddenly I heard a snap behind me and turned back to the door. The creature in the photos was standing upright now, looking at me, its head cocked to the side. It twitched jarringly back and forth like a badly puppeted doll. Then, in an instant, it leapt at me. It ran so unnaturally. Its legs jerked and popped while its body stayed rigid, and it moved so remarkably fast. I brought my weapon up again, sighting in on it as it reached its long fingers out, grabbing at me. It reached to the forefront of the picture as I fired. I could have sworn that its fingers breached through to the material world. I emptied an entire mag into the door. I heard the splinters of wood as my bullets cut through. Sawdust kicked up as I reloaded and aimed again, waiting to see the creature's body in front of me. But I didn't see it. The thing was gone. The only thing in front of me was a bullet-riddled white door. I heard Wade groan, feeling the ground creak as he sat up. Ah, uh, what the hell just happened? He asked, looking up at me. I reached out to him, extending my hand for him to take. Nothing, man. Don't worry about it. He eyed me for a moment, but grabbed onto me as I helped pull him up. Let's go. I said with a sigh, looking away from him and turning to the door. Almost there. I heard the sound of his bolt being pulled back as I began walking. Right behind you. My boots splintered the bullet-riddled door off of its hinges as Wade and I swept through the room. Pitch black welcomed us, our chem lights barely able to function as we made our way in. We were no longer in a hallway, that much I could tell. There was a feeling of a vast emptiness as we spread out. I skirted along the wall to the left, creeping slowly. I was only about thirty feet in when I heard something. You, there, it. Snippets of Trevor's voice crackled in my headset. I stopped my tracks. Wade, did you hear? I did. We must be on the other edge of the house. See if you can get a better signal. I pushed forward a few more yards as the static slowly started to fade. Whiskey two, come in. Paige, anyone. Trevor sounded manic, searching out into the ether, desperate for a response from his team. I wasted no time. This is Whiskey five online. How copy? Kid? Oh, thank goodness. I could almost hear the weight lifting off his shoulders. Where the hell are you? Got separated from Paige and Eric. Wade's with me, but I gotta tell you, it's Fubar in here. We need assistance. Where's the orchid, Whiskey Five? Shay's gruff voice cut through the static before Trevor got a chance to respond. This question took me back. I mean, I know the orchid takes a precedent, but still. Location unknown at this time. If we have another team, we can find Paige and- Negative. He shot back before I could even finish. Whiskey 5, be advised. Mission parameters have been adjusted. You will find and retrieve the orchid. Linking up with Whiskey and Delta will be a secondary priority. I felt a twinge of anger beginning to bubble up in my throat. On whose orders, sir? On mine, rookie. Don't make me repeat myself. I heard the squeaking of plastic as I dug my palm into the rifle grip. This wasn't part of the original brief. 
I don't give a shit what it's a part of. He shouted back over the comm channel, loud enough to make my ear ring. My op, my orders. There are enough brain cells left in that inbred cesspit you call a skull to follow orders, isn't there? That's enough. Trevor shouted out. The channel went quiet for a moment, leaving only the quiet hum of radio static. Listen, kid. He came back a moment later. I don't like it any more than you do, but my hands are tied. I looked back over to Wade. His face was building with anger at the disrespect. It's not your fault, Trevor. I understand. What can you give me? He let out a sigh and thought for a moment. If you can give me a minute, I'll get the power rerouted. Should be easier to maneuver when you're not bumping into shit, eh? If that's what you can give me, I'll take it. I said solemnly. Roger, stand by. With that, the line went dead again. Don't hold it against him, Wade said after a moment to break the silence. He just doesn't want to see us riding the bench again like these past few months. It's not him I'm angry at. I shot back. It's that knockoff Wolverine up there with him. Wade let out a small chuckle. You're not the only one. We stood there and waited for what felt like an eternity. I listened for anything I could. Eventually, I started to hear something. Something organic. Squelching and churning like fluid being pushed through a tube. What the... Kid, you there? Trevor's voice came back, breaking me from my thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. Roger, bringing power grid online in three, two, one. The lights flickered before settling and illuminating the space. The fluorescent buzzing drowning out the sound. I was blinded for a moment, having to shield my face and wait for my eyes to adjust. What I saw when they did made me want to claw them out. We had found Delta. Well, what was left of them anyways. Their lifeless bodies were twenty feet above us, lashed to the rafters by large, white vines. Stems protruded from their husks, implanted into their bodies. A massive, organic tube was jammed into their mouths, pumping out fluids in a loud, sickly squelch. It swayed gently, clinging to the skin-covered skeletons. They looked like they had been dead for decades, but there was no doubt. From the ripped clothing they had on, to the emblazoned D that clung to a scrap of fabric on their shoulders, it was them. I struggled to keep the vomit in the back of my throat from bursting forth as Wade threw caution to the wind, ripping off his mask and puking on the floor. I wasted no time in trying to get through to Trevor. Whiskey five to whiskey one. We got a problem. We got a big problem. I shouted into the headset. What's going on, kid? Trevor's concerned voice came over as I looked over and watched Wade quickly wipe his mouth, putting his mask back on with his shaking hands. Delta is dead. I said matter-of-factly. I'm looking at the bodies now. The plant is draining them of... Well, I don't know what it's doing, but they're gone, man. Shay cut back over once again, in a calm, callous tone, echoing through the static. Leave the bodies. Finish the mission. But do what you're told, rookie. They're useless now. The line went dead as I let out a frustrated scream. I hate to keep up the bad news, Wade said after I threw my voice out. But a thought just occurred to me. I looked over at him as my mind reached the same conclusion. If that's Delta... Then who's with Pate? A shot rang out to the east as Wade and I took off. We ran through door after door, paying no mind to the walls, once beset by dark and beautiful wood, now covered in a mass of white, pustulous vines. The hallways had turned into a hellish jungle. Where carpet had been hours before, a damp earthen floor had taken over. The air felt hot and sticky on my skin, causing my clothes to stick to my body. I didn't care. I just needed to reach them in time. Wade charged forward and drove his shoulder into what was now a rotted mass of planks, opening us up into the foyer. We saw them, Paige and Eric backed against a wall, draped in vines that were slowly snaking their way down to them, looming before them, cackling in an unnatural and nearly manic troll, stood a group of creatures. They may have at one point been human, but that was no longer the case. The figures before me now were emaciated, deformed and hungry. Their mismatched limbs were protruding from every part of their Lovecraftian mass, the monster's skin had been peeled back, exposing the white bone that now spiked itself throughout their bodies. Not one of them had eyes, just differing amounts of pitch-black slits that dotted their now-deformed heads. Each one jerked back and forth in the same puppet-like fashion as Raoul did in the picture, lashing out at them, taunting them, drinking in their fear. I didn't hesitate. My body functioned on instinct as I raised my rifle and watched the torrent of bullets rip them to shreds. Wade followed my lead as the room began to fill with the sounds of gunfire and the stench of carbon. It took a moment for the dust to settle. I had my fingers still pressed down on the trigger, even though I had run dry two minutes ago. Finally, I saw Paige, 
She sprinted to me and embraced me in a tight hug. I felt the tears that were running down her cheeks coat my neck as Eric walked up behind her, his rifle slung across his shoulders. Man, I gotta tell you, your timing is impeccable, Eric said as he let out a massive sigh. Wade and I let out a soft chuckle as I looked down at Paige. She finally let go and looked back at me, wiping her eyes. We tried to wait. These things, we thought they were Delta. They started to change. If you guys hadn't shown up, I, I don't know. She trailed off as I gave her an understanding nod. She took a moment to herself as she fiddled with her earpiece. Whiskey One, this is Whiskey Two. How copy? I'm here, Paige. Are you okay? Where's Eric? Trevor came back over the radio, speaking ecstatically. Right here, Doc. Thanks to Marcus here. We need an exfil. Yeah, about that. Trevor's voice deflated as he explained the situation. Livid was an understatement to Paige's emotions after Trevor finished filling her in. I couldn't even keep up with the Spanish she was using, but I knew enough to know that Shay would be on her shit list till the day he died. Damn it! She shouted as her boot went through an abomination skull. I think she just needed to break something, to feel like she had some sort of control. After a moment, she caught herself and found her composure, exhaling a deep sigh as she looked at the lot of us. We gotta find this thing, she said, grabbing her rifle and checking the ammunition. If it's grown large enough to start affecting such a large area, we can assume it will need to be in an equally large space. It's not like it can grow legs or anything. Well, Eric began as he chambered another round. I mean, we don't know that it can't. We stood there for a few minutes, each of us silently thinking about our next move. What about the basement? I said. Think about it. It's still a plant after all. You can't just put it in a vase like a bouquet of roses. It needs a place to lay down roots. Everyone turned and nodded to each other in agreement. If only we had known at that time what was waiting for us down there, we would have left and turned this place into ash. The first thing I noticed upon entering the basement was the smell. Even with my mask pumping filtered air into my lungs, I still picked up that sickly sweet smell, like butterscotch and bubblegum boiled in a vat of maple syrup, courtesy of the green pustules coating the walls, pumping out a dense green mist. Holy hell, Eric said, while trying to stifle a wheeze. Smells like a warehouse full of old spice in here. Try breathing in through your mouth. Paige responded quietly. Seemed like she was still trying to maintain her professionalism, even after everything that had happened. The scent won't be as overpowering. Ten for a cap. I'll be the best mouth breather here. Eric chuckled to himself as my foot hit solid ground. I think I hit the bottom. I radioed back as I felt Wade's presence behind me. The air was thicker here, almost heavy like I felt its weight more than the vest and rifle I was carrying. The fact that the only light showing was from the plants covering the wall to my left made it even harder for me to get my bearings. Whiskey one, this is five. I said, continuing to scan the room, struggling to make my eyes adjust. Loud and clear, five. Trevor's gravelly voice cackled back. Send it. We've reached the basement. No power, though. Care to help out? No can do, kid. Nothing in the blueprints of wiring running down there. You're in the dark now. Of course we are, I thought as I reached for the light on my rifle. I'd ask you not to do that. A voice came from everywhere and nowhere at once. Bright light hurts my eyes. It was a woman's voice, calm and soothing like a mother trying to comfort a crying baby. No one said a word. I felt the air grow thicker on my shoulders, like some invisible force was holding me down, preventing me from moving. It wasn't fear this time that kept me in place. It was exhaustion. I didn't want to move. I just wanted to stand and rest, to close my eyes for a moment. Allow me to help you, child, to light your path into my heart, the voice called out to us again. I could feel the weight lift for a moment with the words she spoke. All my cares and worries gone in an instant as the walls began to move. This low, undulating sound gurgled throughout the room as glowing plants pushed themselves out from the walls and floor. Not all at once, but in rows, two rows, a pathway. My feet moved on their own. I didn't so much walk as I shuffled, following this path of bioluminescent plants to wherever they took me, wherever that voice came from. I knew that I just needed to be in her presence, to be embraced by something so loving. I exited that room and made my way through a long hallway, its walls painted as if by the brush of a gardener, as flowers bloomed from every crack and seam. Eventually, I came to the end of my search. My rest and respite was on the other side of this giant oak door. It stood easily eight feet tall, 
carved from wood so ancient I could feel her reach out to me through the very fibers from which it was crafted. Come to me, my child. Come and take your final form away from this fleshy shell. I obeyed, and I opened the door. Beyond that threshold could only be described as heaven. A bright light bathed over me, warming me to my core. I felt clean. All the blood and grime coating me beforehand was gone. The sweat that had dripped off my forehead vanished. I was as pure as the woman who stood in front of me. She was the vision of beauty, wrapped in a white floral gown with long, dark hair that went to her waist. A smile that made me melt, accented by a dimple on her right cheek. She opened her arms wide, beckoning me to embrace her, white petals falling from her hands. I did everything I could to make my way to her. As tired as I was, damn it, I would crawl if I had to. My hands reached out to her. I was speechless. I mean, I could have used a million words to describe her, but the only one that fit was perfection. I finally reached her, reached out for her, just hoping to have so much as a glancing touch. She reached out with her slender, pale hand, caressing my face. I felt that warmth that had touched my soul radiate from her fingertips. It was an overwhelming bliss. You're so tired, so pained by this rotted world. I think you've suffered enough, don't you? I nodded, my mouth dry and mute. My hands began to go limp as I felt the grip of my rifle starting to slip. I can give you rest, she cooed softly. Whatever it is your heart desires, you simply need to let me in. I started to nod, to say yes and accept her offer. Finally be able to close my eyes, my mind. I deserve this, but that's not what escaped my lips. My friend. I managed to say in a low, monotone droll, after some serious effort. She began to giggle. No, that wasn't quite right. She was laughing, laughing as if she had just been told a terrible joke. There was nothing soft and comforting. What I had said seemed to be so ridiculous it amused her. Forget them, she said after finally calming herself. They shall serve me in other ways. With that, she slowly slid her fingers down my cheek, grabbing my chin and turning it to look behind me. I saw what she meant. Past the beauty, past the shimmering light and an aura of warmth and love, stood an open doorway. A doorway back to the world of grime and pain I had just left. Beyond that doorway stood three bodies, writhing and struggling against a sea of dark green vines that had lashed them to the wall. The plants pulsed and shifted oddly, wriggling at erratic speed as they struggled to pin down the rest of the team, more like tentacles than actual plants. Look, Look at, at them. them. The woman's voice rang out again, just as soft as the first time I heard it, but somehow wrong, like another voice was speaking in tandem with hers. A low, guttural, almost demonic tone that slid in under her honeyed words. Merely food for my children, either too stupid or invalid to accept my gifts. I saw them writhing in agony, Eric using his rifle to try to press the floral mass off of him, Wade grabbing and tearing whatever he could in half. His mask was cracked and ripped nearly off his face. Paige I could barely see, only the top of her head was visible while she struggled against the weight. They looked exhausted, three tiny specks in an ocean of green. Wade's eyes met mine as the woman spoke again. Those, those who, who fail, fail to evolve need not, not worry about rest. rest. They, they will rest, rest eternally as those unremembered. I heard that undertone again, this time only louder. In fact, her voice was the only thing I heard as I looked on, watching my team be crushed. I locked in on Wade again, his eyes meeting mine, and I could have sworn I saw his mouth move. Do not wait for them. The voice was more devil than darling now, a black abyss of malice and hate. I caught Wade's mouth moving again and focused intently, trying to read his lips as they strained in the forced silence. One word, offset. They were never special. The demon's guttural voice echoed in my mind as my body shivered like a snake sliding its tongue up my neck. Offset, to combat by distraction, often using an embarrassing or outlandish memory that can't be corrupted. I tried to search my brain through the fog that had taken over it. I found nothing. All my thoughts felt gray and foggy, clouds obscuring my very being. I had to look for something, something to reach out and to pull reality to me. 
They were never like Raoul. I found my answer as I tried to get my body to move. My left hand felt like it was stuck in mud as I slowly forced it down my right arm. My eyes remained locked on Wade's silhouette as it began to be consumed by the mass. I was running on faith as my hand gripped my pinky, pulling it to its furthest point. Twinges of pain coursing through my mind, I closed my eyes and I took a deep breath. They were never like you. The next sound I heard was my finger breaking at the joint. The one after that was a gut-wrenching scream escaping my own lips. My eyes opened and I turned. The thing before me was no longer a beautiful woman. Her long, dark hair became a matted, greasy mess that stuck to a sickly green and twisted body. The joints hung in odd angles, protruding through the skin. Her once angelic face now took the form of a starfish, budding flowers overgrowing out through white bone. A large black hole sat in the center, oozing out a sickly green slime. No longer did I hear the dulcet tones of a mother, only alien-like clicking and popping that escaped from somewhere at no set cadence. It looked at me for just a moment, jerking its head to the side in confusion. It only took another moment for me to draw my pistol and put a round through its face. The creature recoiled in agony, sending out a pained screech that nearly burst my eardrums. I fought through the pain and fired again. The second shot sent it sprawling to the ground. I rushed forward, trying to ignore my useless hand as I planted a boot on its chest. You're not a god, I said quietly through gritted teeth. Just a weed with legs. The creature roared and shot its face towards me, opening and closing with a gross suckling sound. The only thing it latched onto were the bullets that erupted from the chamber as I emptied the mag. It had stopped moving after the third shot. The other five made sure it stayed still. I looked around, waving the gun smoke away from my mask, trying to find my bearings once again. The bioluminescence that once lit the room slowly began to fade. All the vines that infested the walls started to wilt and grow limp. That's when it hit me. Crap. I turned around and sprinted back towards the doorway, hoping beyond hope I still had time. Shit, 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 shit. Guys, can you hear me? I reached the wall covered in dying vines, frantically pulling at them with my good hand. I didn't have to dig too long before a large, dark hand shot through the pile, then another. They came together and tugged at a massive clump, ripping them out with a sickening, sucking sound. The massive body of Wade shot through its confinement, gasping for breath, before turning and grabbing at the vines next to him. Don't just stand there, man, he shouted, gasping for breath. Help me get the others. It took a few minutes, but we managed to claw our way through dragging a near-unconscious Eric and a definitely unconscious Paige from the tangled mass. We should be good to lay him down, I said as I sat Paige's limp body on the dirt, letting out a sharp yelp of pain caused by my finger glancing her kit. What the hell happened? Wade asked as he dropped Eric's body to the ground with a heavy thud. A low groan slowly came from him that Wade ignored as he walked over and grabbed my hand. I sucked in hard through my teeth and jerked away. Ah, uh, man, I slept on it wrong. What do you think? Stop flinching, he said, reaching out and pulling my arm into his vice-like grip. You're useless until we get this fixed. You're the one to talk, I muttered under my breath. What was that? He looked at me, cocking an eyebrow. Oh, nothing. But we need to go find Raoul and grab the flower. We can take care of this later. He cocked his head to the side to give me a, really, bro, look, until his attention was focused elsewhere. He released his grip and stepped past me. Found him. Raul Delgado was dead. For how long, I'm not sure, but his bone-white body, trapped against a stone chair by vine-like chains, told me that he had been for some time. Man, I said under my breath as Wade searched him. He looked as he did in the picture. Same cocoon-like head, same lattice-like bone around his body. Like a weird, modern piece of art. Dude's been dead for months, Wade said, wiping the grime and dirt on the side of his pants. He stood up quickly and thumbed his communicator over to the op channel. Whiskey three to one. How copy? We listened to static for a moment before Trevor came over the other side. Read you loud and clear. Three. Send it. Bound Elgato. Not breathing, but we got him here in the basement. Shay's voice quickly cut through the other line. The flower three. Did you find the flower? Wade's eye cut to the lifeless mass of the starfish plant on the ground and let out a heavy sigh. Yeah, we found it. Gonna need a trash bag for it, though. What the hell do you mean, Three? Shay sounded livid as he spat out over the comm link. I mean that Marcus filled it with enough lead to start a pencil factory. There's a long pause on the radio. 
I was waiting to hear Shay rip me a new one. Instead, Trevor's mountain man twang came over. Mission statement accepted, Whiskey 3. Sanitation team en route. Do you require medical attention? Affirmative. And Trevor, be a doll and send a few stretchers, would you? When I left Elgato's compound, I had to fight the urge to rip my mask off and breathe the fresh air. We stayed for a while with Eric and Paige, waiting for the medics to arrive and even longer for them to set my finger back and splint it. It only took seeing our sanitation squad scurrying around maskless for me to give in. I quickly unstrapped my mask, breathing heavily through my nose and closing my eyes. I think that's why I didn't see Shay's fist as it connected with my temple. You insubordinate piece of trash! The force of the blow set me hard against the wall of the house. I was able to duck just in time as another fist made contact with the siding, cracking it nearly in half. When I give an order, you follow it. This is why Delta died. You and the rest of your shitbag team. I stood up and took a stance. I wasn't sure if I could take him in this condition, but I could take enough. I braced myself as he lunged forward. The blow never came. In the blink of an eye, Trevor and Wade had him pinned against the wall, him straining and turning even more red with anger. What the hell is your problem? Trevor bellowed. How dare you touch him? Shay eventually broke free. He was breathing heavily as he stood and pointed a finger my way. Do you have any idea the amount of money that Orchid could have carried? All for this little shit to waste. Need I remind you? Trevor began. That was the result of immediate reaction on my team's part. I'm not going to lose another one because you're seeing dollar signs. Oh yeah? Shane puffed his chest out and stepped in front of Trevor. They stood nose to nose, neither man taking their eyes off the other. Wasn't that hard for you in Oslo, was it? I felt the heat coming from Trevor as he balled his fist. You're really going to blame Oslo on me? You were the op lead. You tell me. You got some set of balls saying that. Why is it that when men get into fights, the subject of testicles always comes up? Kate's soft, dulcet tones cut through, causing us all to turn. She was standing there with the rest of her team, ghillie suit hanging loosely off her slender frame, rifle slung across her back. This doesn't concern you, Watanabe, Shay said, his eyes turning back to Trevor. Grab your shit and prep for Axville. On the contrary, she spoke as she elegantly strode to where Shay stood. I'd like to think anything related to Merc on Merc violence would be in the front of any TL's mind. She grabbed him forcefully and spun him to face her. Wouldn't you agree, Shay? After all, friendly fire is a hell of a way to go. The gorilla of a man growled, replying with a sneer. Yeah, you would know all about that, wouldn't you, Dollface? There was a collective hush and intake of airs as she giggled softly and leaned to meet his face, her lips inches from him. I know enough to know you can't prove a thing, but if the rumors are true, then I would know exactly where to bury the bodies, wouldn't I? That was enough for Shay to stay quiet. He stormed off, grumbling something about corporate and margins. Kate blew him a kiss and laughed again before turning to Trevor, Wade, and me. Appreciate the help, Kate. Trevor spoke first, breaking the silence. Things were looking hairy for a second there. She waved her hand dismissively. Think nothing of it. He's an ass and all talk. Mostly, anyway. Try to actually stay out of trouble, yeah? She smiled and laughed again, turning and walking back to her team as they loaded into SUVs that were taking us back to the city. Dead men are a pretty big turnoff for me. She yelled out, not looking back as the door shut behind her. I think I'm in love, I said after a few moments. The laughter from Wade and Trevor was so loud it masked the sound of tires from our transport as they pulled up beside us. Wade shook his head, still chuckling as he grabbed my rifle and his dead man walking. Yeah, kid, Trevor spoke after seeing the vehicle carrying Eric and Paige off. You'll have a better time surviving on missions than with her. Trust me. Oh, I asked as I climbed into the passenger seat. And how would you know? Story for another time, kid. Trevor grunted as he shut the door. Story for another time. Let's just grab some rest. Gotta report bright and early for an ass chewing tomorrow. He didn't have to tell me twice. I was already slumped against the window, quickly falling asleep. It had been a long ass night. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a good night.